Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, Welcome to, to the November 3rd uh, Blue Earth County Board of Commissioners meeting. We are going to start with our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, <clears throat> we'll go to our agenda, Bob. Mr. Chair, there are no changes to the agenda today. Oh. Lankhammer moves approval of the agenda. People seconds. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Jesse, could you call a roll, please? Commissioner Purvis. Aye. Commissioner People. Aye. Commissioner Lankhammer. Aye. Commissioner Brunder. Aye. Chair Stuenberg. Aye. Now we are going to talk about the Highway 14, Kassaw 56, 55, and 17 intersections uh, near Eagle Lake. Absolutely, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak today, as well as thank you to... Okay, we lost sound. He's not muted. I think he's froze. It looks like his screen is froze. Scott, I think your screen is froze. Hmm. Show us how important good internet connections Ryan, are. Ryan, you want to take over for us, I, please? I don't want to take over for Scott, but I'm wondering if Ann Wolf is on the line, if she could maybe jump in and... Uh, help with this. Ann is uh, leading some of the public outreach efforts until we get Scott back on the line. Oh. She's muted. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I'm actually just going to send Scott a message here quick um, and see if he's able to hop back. I don't think it's us this time. <laughs> no. Anne's muted again. And well, she was going to. She's, she's to trying to get a hold of Scott. Scott. Oh, okay. Yeah. There's Scott. I see him back. <clears throat> All right, folks. I apologize. Power outage. I have no idea why. Oh, my oh no. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> you know, despite all of this working from home during the pandemic, this is the first time. So lucky me that it just happens to coincide with a presentation to you all. <laughs> so if you'll bear with me, just want to make sure that I am displaying my screen. Can you see it all? Or can you all see it rather? Not yet. No. Not yet. No. All right. Just one second. All right, let's try that. There we go. There Thank you. No, no. All right. Well, I apologize for the, the hiccup there, but nonetheless, wanted to thank you all for the opportunity to, to chat with regard to the Highway 14 and County Road or County State Highway 56 intersection on the west edge of Eagle Lake. I wanted to cover four things today. A quick update on the, the status of our both outreach with City of Eagle Lake as well as the pavement markings that were placed at the intersection. Wanted to review the results from our online public engagement effort that concluded last evening. Wanted to discuss some of the comments that came from that outreach effort and ultimately identify a preferred alternative that we can move forward with for, for a safety improvement project in the summer of 2022. The, the schedule is incredibly tight, even when contemplating construction in 2022, and we will have to have that preferred al alternative selected by the middle of this month in order to be successful in delivering for 2022. So last evening, gave this very same presentation to the Eagle Lake City Council, and as we go through it, I will share some of the the comments as well as thoughts that the council had with regard to the information I'm going to provide. Now, when we last spoke, I had commented that MnDOT was moving forward with the installation of some additional pavement markings on County Road 56 as a, a, as Highway 14. 
In particular, the installation of a stop bar to help to encourage motorists to stop closer to the intersection. That stop bar is shown in the, the upper left corner, at least its proposed location, as well as the installation of additional centerline markings. And the goal with moving that marking or installing that marking close to the intersection was to, to improve that view for County Road 56 motorists, as shown in the, the picture in the lower left corner of the screen. Thought process being, if we can help to improve their view of that oncoming eastbound traffic, it would help them to, to better select a gap in, in their um, entrance into the intersection. Now that stop bar didn't get put exactly where I was hoping it to be installed. The installation that actually happened here in the middle of October is shown on the right side of the screen. And it is a little bit further back from where, where I was anticipating it being installed. And through the discussion with city council last night, there were some thoughts that, yeah, it should still be moved closer to the intersection. And then there were others that thought, eh, you know what, it actually works pretty well in its, its existing location. And from observing the intersection, it, it has significantly improved motorist behavior. We are seeing motorists stop at the stop bar, which is about 20 feet closer to the intersection than they were previously. So we have significantly improved their view of that oncoming eastbound traffic. Ultimately, the conclusion that was that was reached last evening was because the equipment is winterized and we won't have an opportunity to, to replace it this fall yet, that we would monitor motorist behavior at the intersection during this fall and winter period and then ultimately make a call in the spring as to as to whether that stop bar should be relocated or if its existing location would suffice. Any questions on the markings at the intersection? No. Looks, looks good from here. All right, then I will keep moving forward to the, the big topic here, our online engagement results. So there is a project website that has been established. And as part of that project website, there was a survey that was running from October 19th through yesterday. And as of 9 o'clock yesterday morning, the survey had 243 respondents. And I think perhaps the most telling out of that survey was there were numerous instances where people that were taking the survey commented that they appreciated the, that the project partners had, had identified the safety issue and were taking steps to ultimately resolve it. So that was very good to hear. Of the, the people responding to the survey, 65% self-identified as Eagle Lake residents, 32% responded as commuters or pass through traffic, and then the remaining 3% either identified as other or freight hauling or business owners. The, the survey had an embedded video that went through the three concepts that were being contemplated. So about a seven minute video that walked them through the the right in right out concept, concept number one, the three quarter access, which is concept two, and then the R cut concept, concept number three. And after viewing the survey, excuse me, after viewing the video, the survey asked them whether or not they had watched the video. And 99% of those responding said that they did indeed watch the video. Also included in that video was a reference to a frequently asked questions portion of the project website because again, we understood that we had a limited amount of time to, to give a lot of information to folks watching the video and it couldn't all be covered in that short amount of time. So they were pointed to a frequently asked questions portion to identify some of the, the more detailed items surrounding potential solutions that were considered but ultimately not a good fit for the intersection. After watching the video, after answering that question as to whether they had watched the video, then they were presented the three concepts and they were asked to score each concept on a five star scale. One star being strongly dislike, all the way to five stars being strongly like. With regard to concept one, the right in right out, where again the median at the intersection that exists today would be closed and no left be allowed at the intersection. Concept scored on average 2.18 stars with 83% liking or strongly liking and 69% disliking or strongly disliking. Concept two, the three-quarter intersection. This concept would 
continue to allow the left on Highway 14 onto CASA 56, it would still prohibit the left from CASA 56. This concept did score higher at 2.72 so with 32% of respondents liking or strongly liking the concept, 50% disliking or strongly disliking. And then finally, concept three, the R cut, average for 3.06 stars, 43% liking or strongly liking, 40%. In addition to the, the star criteria and ultimately scoring each concept, each survey participant was then also offered the opportunity to, opportunity to share comments. Reform so they could type in whatever they wanted. Of the 243 responses, the majority of folks did type in comments, and I did try and compile some common themes that came out of those comments. And they are ranked here based upon the number of, of mentions. So the number you see after the comment is how many times that would. 23 times respondents made a comment with regard to some form of grade separation being their their preferred alternative for this intersection. And that ran the gamut from an interchange to an overpass bridge to some sort of flyover ramp to facilitate that northbound to westbound movement. Uh, this was covered in the frequently asked questions portion of the website that outlined the fact that due to topographic limitations, lake on the north side, as well as the, the existing cases in the southwest quadrant, that an interchange really isn't feasible at this location. There was also dialogue in the frequently asked questions portion surrounding funding, the simple fact that we don't have enough funding to take care of all of the needs, let alone address some of the niceties that we would like to see on our highway system. So this was covered in the FAQ, but not specifically in the video or in the survey. Uh, another common trend was and this is to the credit of the folks that were taking the survey, they acknowledged or recognized that the, the crash problem that we're having at the intersection is with northbound CASA 56 traffic getting hit by eastbound Highway 14 traffic. And they, they posed the question, with an R cut, we're still going to have that movement of that traffic needing to cross the eastbound lanes to get to the dedicated turn lane that serves the U-turn. So really, how is that going to solve the problem? And we, we will revise the FAQ to specifically include a, a response to this common question. And really what it boils down to is, with the existing intersections configuration, there are a number of things that the SL 56 motorists have to, to comprehend and, and ultimately contend with. They need to find a gap in eastbound Highway 14 traffic, which during peak hours can be difficult at times, they then need to perceive that there is an existing acceleration lane. And if they don't perceive that, then they're also trying to find a gap in westbound traffic as well. And then on top of that, they're also trying to contend with westbound Highway 14 traffic that's turning left onto Kassam 56. So there are a number of, of components that motorists are trying to juggle in their mind to find that sweet spot and gap. And when you think about all of those mental gymnastics that are required, it's, it's not surprising that people are, are at times having an issue of getting into crashes as a result. The R cut would obviously simplify that significantly because at that point they are really only needing to find a gap in the eastbound Highway 14 traffic, at which point they can cross directly into the dedicated turn lane that serves the U-turn. So at a high level, first blush, it would seem that the R cut wouldn't solve this problem, but by removing all of the, all of the Items that need to be tracked at the intersection are greatly reducing the number that need to be tracked. We would see a crash improvement. There were frequently requests for westbound acceleration lanes to be included as part of the RPET concept. And we covered that during our last discussion here with the, with the board. There are two options for a westbound acceleration lane. You could either install one on the median side which becomes problematic for two items. One, really only passenger cars would be able to make that tight U-turn 
into that acceleration lane. Um, vehicles towing trailers or semis would not be able to make that tight turn. Then also there is the conflict with traffic in a median acceleration lane potentially conflicting with traffic that is trying to get over into a dedicated left turn lane at Kassau 56. That then brings us to another option, which would be putting the westbound acceleration lane on the outside or the north side of the westbound 14 lanes. And that in and of itself also comes with complications because while folks could pull directly into it, they at some point would need to merge back into 14 traffic. That is another conflict point. And then also, similar to the, the grade separation discussion, it is a matter of cost. So from a traffic volume perspective, while those acceleration lanes would really be nice, it's, it's a want and it's not a need. So we need to really focus what limited funding resources we have on the needs versus the wants. A surprising comment that, that came up eight different times from the survey respondents was just to leave the intersection as is. And a lot of these comments, and granted, they could, they could be made anonymous. There was, there was no requirement for email address or contact information. But a lot of the eight people that made this comment, it was, this is just poor behavior on the part of motorists. The vast majority of folks are able to get through the intersection. Don't add any inconvenience, just leave it alone. And I think that all three pro project partners recognize that we all at times can make a mistake and we shouldn't have to pay for that mistake with either a trip to the hospital or even worse, our lives. And so while the vast majority of folks are able to safely navigate the intersection, we have an opportunity to improve the safety of the intersection to make sure that no one is ultimately paying for a mistake with their life. Seven times folks actually asked for eastbound acceleration lanes. So for Kassau 56 traffic looking to continue east, they were asking for an acceleration lane. Again, this ties back in with the discussion on westbound acceleration lanes that, again, this would be a really nice element to have, but it's not a need. The frequently asked questions portion of the, of the website also covered flasher systems. So traffic approaching when flashing, traffic entering when flashing, similar to what is deployed on Highway 60 between Faribault and I-35. The FAQ talked about how those systems were experimental and ultimately we're not seeing a reduction in crashes or improvement in safety where they are installed. And ultimately, MnDOT is not looking to pursue installation of additional systems. Reviewing the FAQ is not a requirement to the surveys, so some folks might have seen it, some folks might not have, but ultimately six people did ask for some form of flashing light to warn motorists of approaching traffic at the intersection. There was also a concern about concept one, which would have diverted traffic onto Kassau 55 or Lee Ray Avenue, but the fact that it is a residential environment and not wanting to send highway traffic or diverted highway traffic onto that road, that came up four times. And then also another FAQ element was discussed why reducing the speed limit on Highway 14 isn't a good option. Despite that, we did still have three people that suggested it as an alternative to the, the three concepts that were presented. So those are some of the, the common trends that came out of the, the survey responses. I'm curious, does the board have any questions on these trends or in particular the, the results that we got? When you gave the second concept, did you explain that there would be signs coming out of uh, Casey's that would send them down to County Road 17 and over to 12? We did. Um, that was part of the presentation and we showed a graphic and, and an example of what some of that signage would look like. I think, Mr. Chair, that a lot of it boiled down to there was a perception that Old 14, Casa 17, that the vast majority of motorists using that road aren't perhaps driving as fast as others would like them to. And again, this is me reading between the lines. That survey respondents didn't want to be required to drive on, say, a 55 mile per hour road. 
despite the fact that when you contend with the amount of time that it takes to find a gap in 14 traffic to, to successfully get onto westbound 14, coupled with the safety aspect of using old 14 or Casa 17, those those benefits didn't weigh in their mind enough sufficiently to to endorse concept two. Okay. All and right. another comment that came up too, I had a couple of people call or email. They had pointed out, well, boy, you know, you got to go through a lot of roundabouts on Casa 17 to get up to Conroe 12. And just quickly plugging it into Google, it would add about three minutes to the trip time, say from K if you were leaving Casey's and bound for the, the junction of Highway 14 and, and State Highway 22. Using uh, CASA 17 and the CASA 12 interchange would add three minutes to the trip. Folks weren't super keen on that either. All right. Good information. Thank you, Scott. Absolutely. So I, uh, well, I allow you all to, to contemplate questions or additional thoughts. I can share that when I was presenting this to the Eagle Lake City Council last evening, uh, really I can boil it down to a they're not super fond of, of any of these concepts, but they, they understand the need to balance safety and access. And ultimately, at the end, they concluded that concept three, the art cut, would be their preferred alternative given the circumstances. All right. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Good morning, Scott. Commissioner Brunder here. Good morning. Um, I'm not surprised by these survey results. I mean, we all know that if you have to pick from these three, I think the concept three did give us the most movement and some safety aspects. Um, my, my one question or several questions and maybe later, but uh, has anybody reached out to Casey's and visited with Casey and the management there as far as what's going on here? Or have they just been involved through the normal process with the public comment period? Yeah, we, we have not directly engaged them just yet. Wanted to at least have an idea of where potentially the project partners wanted to head. When they constructed their store several years ago, they were put on notice that, that full access at this intersection was never a guarantee in the future. So uh, at least they were, they were put on notice and had that fair warning. I believe that was back 2012 or 2013. I'd have to double check the records to confirm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And, and again, I, I was, I'm not surprised by these numbers at all. And I certainly uh, would support concept three. Uh, I, I just think it is probably the best option we have to still keep some movement there. I'm a big supporter of going down County road 17 out to 12. Uh, we got two beautiful roads there. Yeah. They got a couple roundabouts in them, but them roads work very well. And I know I mentioned this last time when I, commented about this that I use that road all the time just because I don't want to have to try to get out onto county or out onto the highway and it is much safer access and much easier to move traffic through that way so this might defer some people that way and I think after they get used to it they'll probably enjoy it and as I've been out talking with people about this project I'm encouraging people to use that route uh, so if we do do something with this and challenge them to try that route for just a few weeks and try to see how it works for them. Yeah, two or three minutes, it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's more to some people than it is others. Uh, I prefer the safety aspect and the good access over the two or three minutes I can save. But I think if this gets people to start using our other, other roads that we have that, are, that have been all rebuilt and work very well, I, I think it'll be It'll be a good way to get some more people onto County Road 17. And again, I, it'd be nice if we could get a different access there. And I would like to talk more in the future about an interchange in Eagle Lake and where it's going to be. And Ryan and I have had many discussions about this. Where is it going to be? We have so many challenges out there with all three of those intersections. Uh, there's just no real good place to put it except at County Road 12, where we already have one. And so, and I know that's a 
you know, 15, 20 year project, but I would, uh, I would encourage us to start talking about our options, if there is any, because if there isn't any at the end of the day, we need to move on. So I would appreciate that input. Absolutely, Commissioner. And that was, as part of those 23 comments about overpasses, there were frequent comments about, well, Wasika has interchanges, Jeansville has interchanges, and some of the, the feedback that I shared with the city council last evening was, you know, the vast majority of interchanges that were built on 14 were built before we had the R cut in our toolbox. And the fact that, you know, for the cost of one interchange, you can build 10 R cuts, you can improve the safety of 10 different intersections versus make one really, really convenient and safe access. That, that's pretty significant. You know, how do you, how do you tell nine other communities, sorry, I can't solve your problem because I built an interchange over here. And so one of the things I shared with the council was, you know, with our 14 expansion project out to New Ulm, you will see two new interchanges constructed with that project. But it's important to note that Nicola County is bringing millions of dollars to the table to help facilitate the construction of those interchanges. And so what I shared with the council last evening was, you know, an interchange absolutely is, is not out of the cards for Eagle Lake, but I think what it's ultimately going to require is significant cost participation on the part of our local partners to make something like that become a reality in the future. So I don't want to say by no stretch of the imagination will Eagle Lake never have an interchange, but it's going to have some, some it's going to require some significant discussions and some tough decisions with regard to, as you pointed out, where's the best spot to put it, and then ultimately, how do we all pay for it? Yeah, and, and there's just so many geographical challenges. We got a railroad, we got wetland, we got a cemetery, we got developed uh, gas station, uh, just every intersection, every way you turn out there is a challenge. I mean, on top of the money. We, and we just can't change the way the lay of the land is. I mean, it doesn't matter what we do there. So uh, I understand all that, but we just need to try to figure out if there's something we can do out there. Absolutely. Good presentation so far, though. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So then, talking or thinking about next steps. So, City Council of Eagle Lake has already opined. They're supportive of Concept 3. Ultimately, I'm looking for the, the county board to share their thoughts on what direction they would like to head. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, really need to have this decision settled here so that we can really continue or at least really with great effort to kick off our design effort in the middle of this month, which would run through December of next year. So a little over a year to, to get it designed. And then ultimately we would be looking for construction in the summer of 2022. Well, uh, Scott, Commissioner Brunder here again. And I, I certainly will support uh, option number three with the R cut. I don't know if we want a motion on that, or I'm, I guess I'm not sure of the procedure. If, do you just want consensus, or it's not on the agenda for a vote today, but... No. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, uh, we weren't really anticipating a motion being uh, issued today. Uh, we could potentially bring it back on the 7th, or yeah, the 17th would be our next meeting. Yeah, I, I, would, I would prefer that. And we can, I can get up and talk to some people in the community between now and then, but uh, as, at this point, I certainly will support option three. So then, and I apologize, had to figure out how to crank the speaker on my laptop, so I didn't quite catch all of that, but if I understand, ultimately, it will need to come back for a separate agenda item for a formal vote, is that accurate? Yes, so uh, we did not have it on the agenda today as uh, an action item, so we would bring it back on November 17th. Okay, no, and that's, that's perfectly fine. So uh, unless there are reservations or concerns from the board, my plan would be to, to move forward, having our designers ultimately design for concept three, knowing that obviously the board still needs to take formal action on it. Is there any concern with that strategy from the board? Mm, I don't have a no, problem with that. No, no, I think it's, it's all right. Nope, sounds good, Scott. 
outstanding. Well, again, sincere thank yous and appreciation for your time and your continued partnership to, to get to solving the problem that we're having at this intersection. All right. Thank you, Scott. Thank Thanks you. for your time and your work, Scott. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. I think we'll go on to uh, Public Works. Ryan. Good morning again, Commissioners. Good morning, Good morning Ryan. Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Button. You voted. <laughs> Thank you. Decided to take care of that first thing at 7 a.m. this morning before the crowds were there. Uh, MRCI has a polling station just up from our office, and the parking lot is full, the road is full, proceeding to our office, the entire stretch of map drive. So wow. great Isn't to see, exciting? see people getting out there and uh, exercising their the right to democracy. Uh, I, I just got a text. I'm a little concerned. It sounds like there's a power outage um, that goes out to Mount Cato and the, the government center side of power also. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, my. Which impacts some of our um, polling places. So hopefully huh. it doesn't last long. <laughs> well, maybe that had something to do with the power outage that, that Scott had. Scott just had. That yeah, would be my be. assumption. Yeah, I'm not sure where yeah. he, he resides. It's not a good day to have a power outage. It's mm -hmm. not. It's not. But well, I've got some action items for your consideration today. The first item included in the board's packet is professional services agreement for County State at Highway 27, reconstruction in Eagle Lake, including the city utilities. The agreement included in your board packet does include the design of the road, storm sewer, sanitary sewer, and water main obviously the sanitary and water main are city owned utilities that's about a three quarter mile of a long project um, and it does also include an ad alternate for construction staking and for full-time construction observation uh, the county staff plans to administer the construction contract so it would still be a blue earth county contract we would still make payments we would attend weekly construction meetings etc uh, however, the struggle we're having right now is the fact that we have an extremely busy year next year with our own staff, uh, as well as the loss of uh, one of our boots on the ground and design folks who uh, move for family and um, potentially future marital reasons. So I can't fault him for that, but that will leave us with uh, having to replace that position and uncertainty with the experience. Regardless, we're going to be stretched in next year with 41 27 one uh, 57 14 interchange and Casa 82 projects. Our staff is going to be extremely busy. We won't have somebody to put in the field on that project. Um, and we will really struggle to get the construction staking done, especially with the city utilities require extra work that our crews are just not accustomed to doing. Um, so if you look at the cost per foot basis of this proposal, um, and we, we did request a proposal from Bolton and Mink because they are the city's uh, consultant engineer and there's in, in these circumstances um, where there's the overlap with the city utilities included in the project. We, we tend to find um, efficiencies of scale by going this route. Uh, if you look at a cost per foot basis compared to last year in Good Thunder, this year's cost per foot of this proposal is $46.97 for design cost per foot. If you extrapolate that back to the cost of the Good Thunder contract last year, it was $49.77 per foot. So oh. I think it's a relatively good value. It's right within the estimation percentages that we use uh, for these types of projects. So I think it's a reasonable fair bid. The other thing to note for the board would be to uh, mention that it is on an hourly build not to exceed basis so it's not a lump sum it's based on the amount of work that they actually put into the project not to exceed the the amount and if you look at our capital improvement plan uh, i did include in my in my budgeting tool three hundred sixty six thousand dollars of consultant engineering so again right in that ballpark anticipating that we were going to need those boots on the ground help with the project but was uncertain about the staking and we also have some other costs in there for our own engineering staff uh, for right-of-way acquisition and construction for a $3.135 million project total. Um, it, the, the last thing I guess I would point out on this agreement is also a note uh, that project costs are, are expected to be approximately 
50% city, 50% county, when it all shakes out because of the participation with respect to the age of the road and the city is taking on some of that cost because of the premature expiration of their water and sewer mains um, and the fact that they would have the 10% cost share in the road plus that plus their complete cost of their utilities, they'll be on the hook for about 50% of this cost. So I would recommend approval of this professional services agreement. Brenda will move approval. People will second. second. Oh. Got a motion. Who do you have for a second, Jesse? I have Commissioner Purvis. All right. <laughs> he gets he gets the bonus today. <laughs> yeah, he gets the bonus. Any discussion? No discussion, Mr. Chair, but Commissioner Brenda here. I just want to thank Ryan and the staff for working with the City Council and the Eagle Lake and Bolton and Mink to get this project through it. It's a, it is frustrating that we have to take care of sewer and water underneath the road that's still got about 15 or 20 years of life in it, but I think they made the right decision by doing it right, not trying to piecemeal it and making our county road a problem for us in the future. So uh, good work on everybody's part. Thank you. All right, it sounds uh it sounds very positive, but uh, I know you got your workload set up for you for this next year. I guess you're going to earn your money. <laughs> yeah, our staff is going to be extremely busy, so. Jesse, could you call the roll, please? Commissioner Purvis. Aye. Commissioner Pifo. Aye. Commissioner Landcammer. Aye. Commissioner Brunder. Aye. Chair Stuenberg. Aye. All right. Moving on, the next action item in your packet is consideration of the Minnesota Department of Transportation Cooperative Construction Agreement number 1044613. Uh, this is for CASA 44 at the south intersection with Minnesota Highway 60, just on the southwest corner of the city of Madison Lake. Uh, this includes the reconstruction and realignment of 44 at said intersection with the addition of turn lanes and lighting for improved intersection safety. With that being said, the county cost is estimated in the agreement at $96,891.39, of which the city of Madison Lake, under cooperative agreement, is responsible for 10%. So this is actually slightly under what I have been budgeting uh, for this project. I think it'll be a good improvement, bringing the intersection from a, a skewed angle to a tangent 90 degree intersection with better sight distances in each direction and improved lighting and uh, turn lanes. Brenda will move approval. People will second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Jesse, could you call a roll please? Commissioner Purvis. Aye. Commissioner People. Aye. Commissioner Landcammer. Aye. Commissioner Brunder. Aye. Chair Stuenberg. Aye. All right. And near the end of this packet there is a resolution for approval, again, this is part of MnDOT's process uh, that a resolution from the county board to enter into this agreement be approved as well. Brenda moves approval. People second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Jesse, could you call a roll, please? Commissioner Purvis. Aye. Commissioner People. Aye. Commissioner Landcammer. Aye. Commissioner Brunder. Aye. Chair Stuenberg. Aye. All right. And last but not least, uh, is approval of the annual report of the Parks Department for the year ended December 31st, 2019. I, I wholeheartedly apologize for this being this late. I generally would like to bring this when we've approved the uh, Public Works annual report in, generally speaking, July. However, uh, our limited park staff has been flooded with all of the COVID-related issues. I hate to keep going back to that card for an excuse, but it's very real um, in some of the delays that we've been facing and the just tremendous amount of extra work. Uh, so we were able to get this completed. And I, I won't go through it and read it to you page by page because I know that's a, it's a long report and you've all had time to take a look at it. But just to hit on a few of the high points in the summary, it, the first thing I want to point out, and it's under park operations, that our park system benefits greatly from having many dedicated employees. And I want to get that out there because I'm very grateful for the hard work that they put in. They do a fantastic job and they are very dedicated along with our county board, our park advisory board. So we're, we're very fortunate in that regard. There were a total of 6,659 mobile and tent camping nights during the 2019 camping season, a decrease of 500 nights over the previous year of 2018. Revenue collected at Bray, Daly, Duck Lake, and Rapidan Park and Williams Nature Center totaled $166,659.57. Uh, from 
uh, rentals, the wood sales, et cetera. That was a decrease of $15,598.80. Uh, again, likely due to the reduction in camping nights and weather associated. Uh, with that being said, the $3 RT vision fee that was adopted in 2017 generated $6,827.13 to fund the reservation software upgrade that was implemented in early 2019. The reservation system continues to prove its use with 2,447 reservations made online. Um, the park improvements over the year, uh, several, but to hit on a few highlights, 175 tons of riprap for the shoreline at Bray Park, the installation of water softener in the newly remodeled daily area three bathhouse. Um, crews also remodeled the area four bathhouse with wood paneled ceiling, all new lights and fixtures, fresh paint and electrical upgrades. I think we toured that on our road tour. So that turned out very nice. The daily park area one campsites were enhanced with gravel parking pads and the installation of new RV outlets. Uh, construction of a new area one comfort station began at least with respect to the professional architectural plans and bidding. Again, that was moved into 2020 and that's near completion or is effectively completed, but uh, funds were expended in 2020 with the county leading the construction efforts. Um, we also seeded the eight acres of native prairie grasses at Red Jacket Valley Park, along with another 3.16 acres of a dry forb mixture and sealed and leveled the uh, Williams Nature Center, uh, one and a half mile of nature trails. So uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions on the report. I think if we go to page seven of the report, just a couple of graphics that I find more helpful than the sheer volume of text. The one he just went by is my favorite one. Which one? Um, what page is it? It's, it's where all the parks are. Oh, the map. Um, and how many there are. Yes. I mean, I think we're an unusual county for having this many parks for our size. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that's my favorite graph. <laughs> <laughs> no, the parks are actually a diamond here for, for us. I mean, our park staff are second to none. Yes. I mean, they're, they're amazing people. They do an awesome job. I've heard a lot of stuff over the year. Uh, uh, the improvements for Daly Park down down in the southern part of the county, mm -hmm. and how how nice that's been. I'm I'm absolutely very shocked we didn't go a lot lower because of COVID. We had to give up a lot of parking spaces right. because of COVID, and I'm su surprised that we we got as much as we did. Yeah, it was extremely busy given the fact that we had to block off. You know. I think a daily it was a dozen campsites or so. Yeah. Every and every week. Yep. And that's yeah. that's a huge, huge amount over the course of the year. Right. Yeah. That's uh no. Uh, uh but the graphic here is uh summation, a, a pie chart of the park's revenues. You can see that our primary revenue source still comes from the local uh local sale <laughs> or local tax property tax uh, and then from operations about 192,000 and then some miscellaneous revenues totaling about 30,000. And looking at the expenditures, uh, maintenance and operational of our parks consumes the super majority with some funds going to construction and a little bit towards equipment. But it's, it's all, you know, a lot of it's going right back into the parks again, just like our public works program. If we go to page nine, there is a nice bar chart of uh, revenues and reservations. So you can see the camping reservation and the revenues associated with that on the top. You can scroll down to the boat uh, rental revenues. We are seeing a decrease in that. Uh, that'll be almost flat with COVID. A lot of that was suspended. It just, it's, it's a lot of work for the caretakers and with risk associated with COVID for uh, relatively low economic return. I know people do enjoy it, but it's one of those things we had to dial back. Uh, and then you can see wood sales on the bottom. So I think uh, all in all, it, it's tracked fairly well given some of the weather that was had in 19. And then uh, as we do the, the next report for 20, obviously we'll see some impacts associated with COVID. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or would request approval of the report. Move <coughs> approval of the report, Landcammer. People seconds. Get a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
Good report. Good report. Thank really you. nice job. Thank you. Good. Nice job, and yeah, for considering the COVID and all that. I know the guys work hard. Parks. Yep, and again, we'll, all, we'll, we'll all get the, the 21 department. out, the 2020 version out, hopefully much sooner. Well, and, and our, the thing is our park employees don't quit working just because the park shut down. No, nope. yeah. they're because very busy all year round. Now we have to be cleaning up and getting ready for next year. They, they do a lot, and they're not a huge department. That's correct. And, uh, and then when winter comes, they start helping us with snow removal. And, yep. mm -hmm. and you know, this report is put together by Corey and, and um, with the re returns she had to do this year because of the cancellations. Um, and then she's also been helping with some FEMA related issues that we've been <laughs> battling with FEMA to try to get some reimbursement on. So uh, very busy. And, and I think the new software was a good investment. I mean, I, I think that's really important to mm -hmm. invest in some of those things because I think they pay for themselves Absolutely. later on. Yes, thank you. Very positive. Any other discussion? Jesse, could you call a roll, please? Commissioner Purvis? Aye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Landcammer? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Aye. Okay, uh, a few informational items for the board. Construction projects updates. Casaw 10 from Vernon Center to 1. The work is complete. The road's been open to traffic. The final bituminous wearing course will go on next year. We, like to, again, like to leave off that top inch and a half, two inches of hot mix so that if we get any bumps or anything like that or sediment, um, we can go back and take care of it the subsequent year, put a smooth final lift on, get it to that final 10 ton strength. But uh, it turned out to be a really nice project. Um, CASA 41, bridge replacement project, all the pier piling have been driven. Uh, one pier stem has been poured and they're prepping to pour the second pier stem and pier cap this week. Uh, so they're still on track to get the abutments, the piers and the beams set before uh, suspension of work for the winter. CASA 27 from Highway 14 to CASA 2, no work is going to happen this year due to the contractor's workload. They'll begin fresh in spring of 21. We were hoping they would perhaps get some of the drainage work off of the road completed. However, it sounds like they have a busy fall pipe crew workload, so that's not going to happen. But I'm confident they have adequate resources to hit it hard next year. Um, the county stated Highway 16 trail project. Again, I think we've covered that. No work will be taking place this year. The contractor preferred to tackle it all next year, but I think we got obviously good bids because we gave them said flexibility. Planning projects updates. The county stated Highway 57, North Riverfront Drive and US Highway 14 roundabout interchange. Uh, a virtual open house meeting is scheduled for November 17th from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Notice will be sent out this week. I just actually, before the meeting, <coughs> jotted a revision down for the letter, so we're hoping to get that even mailed out potentially today. Uh, we have been coordinating with MnDOT, who is hosting the information on their project website page, and Ann Wolf with MnDOT has been very helpful in coordinating this process, so it'll be a WebEx uh, virtual meeting. And we will offer, also offer the opportunity for some of the other businesses that are going to be heavily impacted or say Loyola to set up an individual meeting with us in that notice as well if they can't attend the virtual meeting or if there's inadequate time to go through all of their concerns. It was in the paper this morning um, talking about the, the projects and that was one referenced. Good, yes. And, and we'll also be doing a public notice for the um, online meeting as well, just to ensure that we've tried to reach out in as many different venues as possible to get the people and press releases, et cetera. Uh, the 90% plans are complete, so we're looking forward to taking on that step and moving this closer to construction. Uh, CASA 1 from 9 to 90, right-of-way and plan completion efforts are ramping up, uh, getting appraisals done, determining final right-of-way limits, beginning to make some of those plan revisions. Uh, should be on track again to deliver that for 2021 uh, construction to start. That'll be a two year long project, most likely given the just sheer size of that project and some of the staging required. CASA 82, Victory Drive from Stadium to Hoffman. The plans are at 60%, moving toward 90. <coughs> We're also talking about public uh, open house meeting for that, again, in a virtual format. We probably could have forced it into the mid December. However, I prefer not to do that. <laughs> I, I like to leave a lot of things out of that December to November, uh, November to December stretch because of the holidays and, and you, people's minds aren't on those types of things. Uh, so we'll target 
early January or early to mid-January for that public open house meeting. Uh, Casat 27, the Eagle Lake Water Main Replacement Project will begin design this month uh, with the approval of the agreement in today's packet. Casa 16, from the Lesseur River to Casa 90, that project was included in our capital improvement plan for 2021 construction. Uh, right now, we're, we've got design in a place where we're comfortable that we could deliver the project. However, uh, I wanted to talk with the board this morning. I think I'm pretty strongly leaning towards probably delaying that project. It's not a critical, mm -hmm. from a time frame standpoint, that I think we could get it on the shelf and done. Um, but given some of the constraints that we're going to have with respect to our workload next year and our staffing, coupled with the uncertainty of revenues due to the COVID impacts we're anticipating in both our construction and maintenance dollars, uh, at least 11% and maybe up to a 15% impact. And just looking at how some other projects have, have kind of jumped up on us with respect to the Eagle Lake in town, uh, Mapleton County Road 7 next year, and also Vernon Center still wanting to go uh, now that they receive bonding dollars for their reconstruction in town. Kind of looking that that project may, we may push pause on that for the time being and delay it to a future year when we've got adequate resources, both revenue and staffing to better facilitate getting it done. Yeah. So I, I wanted to at least make the board aware of that's what we're looking at. If you have any concerns with that, I'm more than happy to discuss it, but just, uh, Okay. okay with that. I mean, we certainly acknowledge the pavement is degraded and it's it's due, but we've got a lot of roads out there that are in that condition, and we're doing our best to keep up with them. Uh, seven in Mapleton from Borkert Street to a half mile south. Uh, last week, I met with the city and the school district to discuss a 2022 project. So we'll be getting to take the next steps, which will include a cooperative agreement and uh, soliciting for proposals for design work. Uh, so that should be should be a positive project between the, the three different entities at play. Uh, maintenance contracts have all been completed for striping, gravel crushing, and gravel hauling. And just briefly, a rapid and dam update. Uh, the county staff met with Bar Engineering to visit the dam and review past reports. We sat down and at length discussed uh, the scope of the proposals that were needed to update both the dam removal feasibility study as well as the dam repair return to service feasibility study. So BAR is working on putting putting a proposal together for both studies and also putting a cost to set proposals. Um, we did talk about reaching out to the DNR to see if they'd have ability to cost participate in perhaps even the removal study. So that's something on my list to get in touch with the DNR, but in parallel BAR will be starting to put the the components together for that study. Uh, I haven't had any official updates from Eagle Creek Renewable Energy about the uh, potential suitor to acquire the Rapid End Hydro uh, operation and lease. However, staff did tell us when we were visiting the dam that they were still planning on having that group come in and do testing of the turbines and some of the electrical generation components. Um, so I think it's a positive sign, but I, unfortunately both things are kind of hinged on each other. Our decision is hinged on what they do and their decision is hinged on what we do. So I'm just uh, doing my best to try to keep our side of the equation moving forward. So I'd be happy to answer any questions with respect to that or anything else I've covered. No, very good. All right. Thank you. That's Thanks, all I Ryan. have. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> short break, Mr. Chair. Yes, we will have a short break. And we don't have any time restraints here. We don't have anybody coming in at 10 o'clock or anything. Okay.
Okay, well, welcome back. We will uh, go to the Blue Earth County Attorney's Office update. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, thank you. I just want to point out a couple of different things. We are in the process of uh, finally upgrading our software system that we've had probably, I believe, for ongoing 12 years now. It'll be a web-based platform, which will be much easier to use as we can access it pretty much from anywhere. Um, a couple of other things. We continue to try to catch up on the mandatory court hearings and whatnot. I've told you before that we typically have between 80 and 100 pages of hearings on any given week. Uh, last week we had 123 pages. This week we have 110 pages. Um, so those numbers continue to go up as we play catch up and I think that we'll continue to play catch up into the first quarter of 2021. So um, other than that, we have been working with some of the school districts. We will continue to work with uh, more of them in the future. We've got a meeting next week with one of the school districts regarding um, since there's a, a lot of virtual learning going on, how do we effectively deal with the truancy issues because it's easy as one of the assistant principals said it's easy for me to say the students sitting in that seat and if they're not sitting in that seat I know that they're truant but if they're working online what can we do to uh, make sure that that they are doing what they need to be doing so we're looking into those issues this is the time of the year that we start getting more and more truancy referrals and working with the school districts and probation on those issues but to try to keep those kids in the school so any questions concerns or comments otherwise I'll let you continue on mr. chair do you seeing any truancy issues being the with the online stuff that's going on right now we have had, uh, there's been an online school for a number of years, and we've right. dealt with that online school. Uh, they're really good about informing us when students aren't achieving what they believe should be achieved. So kind of using that as a measuring stick of what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. Um, so this is, in some respects, not new. It's just that there's so much of it now because students with the virtual learning and some in class, some outside of class and whatnot, but we've had uh, an online school uh, that we've dealt with for at least five years ever since the truancy intervention program started out. So, okay. okay. Um, just one question. Um, um, oh, when you go to, um, I can't think of the right word now. I had it in my brain a minute ago. Um, when people just line up to go to court. Arraignment court. Arraignment court. That's, yes. Um, could you just explain that to people? Because I don't think most people really understand that. Sure. A, the typical arraignment court would be if someone in, receives a traffic citation. Typically, there's, these are misdemeanor cases that are true set for arraignment. Um, if, if they have a speeding ticket, if they have a, a driving after, no insurance, careless driving or whatnot, they can come into arraignment court. They can plead guilty or not guilty. If, it's, if they plead not guilty, then the matter is set on uh, for a pretrial. Then there's also... Uh, rule 8 hearings, Rule 8 hearings typically take place in the afternoon. They'll sprinkle some in the mornings depending, but typically the Rule 8 hearings, and those are associated with gross misdemeanor and felony complaint summons matters, or even uh, warrants and orders of detention, but those are, are different than the misdemeanor track. The gross misdemeanor track and felony track are pretty much the same, but the misdemeanor, you come in and you and plead guilty or not guilty, that's when we send typically uh, depending on the number that are there for arraignment court, two to three prosecutors to try to resolve those cases there so we don't have to open a file in our office so we can get upstream on these. And these are typically um, many times, um, now with the city of Mankato obviously, that, that's the vast majority of the cases, but beforehand it was a lot of the small town cases that, that the county attorney's office would handle and the sheriff's office as well. Are any of those done electronically, or do people have to come in for those? They are doing a hybrid. They um, they have been doing some electronically. They've been doing some quite some for quite uh, quite a few weeks now since uh, I believe it was back in September that Judge Walker um, came in and that we would know that we would get him for two days a week for the rest of the year. So he's here on Mondays and on Thursdays, and he does the the um, traffic calendar the arraignment court and 
the Rule 8s, and then there's an uncontested omnibus block that's typically every two at 2.30 every Thursday afternoon. On Mondays, um, he takes care of kind of the, the regular um, miscellaneous calendar. People come in or, or want to come in for any probates, any type of um, orders for protection, those types of issues. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think it, when we can do it electronically, it's especially if you've got a speeding ticket or something as opposed to having to come in. To me, it makes sense. Right. The judges and, and the clerks and even the attorneys will tell you that doing these hearings over Zoom is much more time consuming than doing them in person. Yeah. Because but the judge has to, the judge and the judge's clerk, if, if you and I are in front of the judge and then they, the judge decides you two need to, to talk, then they've got to put you in a breakout room and then you two come in and, and then you're dealing with something and the judge is bouncing back and forth, but it's, it's, it's definitely much more time consuming for uh, the courts and the attorneys. The court administration will say that as well. It's nice to be able to, to do it, don't get me wrong, because we should be doing it and we have been doing it um, because I know they worked and they finally, right before COVID hit, were able to get ITV in the jail, even though it's not in the jail, it's in the holding cell in between yep. courtrooms D and E. But then at least we can take care of some of those things. Um, once the new judge gets up to speed, so to speak, in Nobles County in Worthington, then the judge in um, Watanwan County will handle all probate matters district wide. Cool. So, and that will take off of our judges' plates the commitments and any of the other probate matters. So that'll be a little bit of a help. There are, the last time that the, the courts, and they, they do this frequently, and I was just talking to Judge Anderson last week about some of these matters and, and timing and how time consuming some of these cases are. There's enough judges within the district. It's just that if you look at the, the judge need in Blue Earth County, is greater than what we have for judges but at about 43 to 45 percent of the population of the fifth judicial district is in blue earth brown and nicola county okay. so that's where the when they shift they end up coming this way yeah it's just interesting um and you know when i think of people you know having to take off work they live in the center and they have right. to come to the courthouse in blue earth <clears throat> county um it, or the justice center um it's kind of that, you know, how do you balance? Right, right. And it's, you know, and, and when, it, when it, it's necessary when it, and when it's beneficial, it's, it's great. You know, when we have, especially on the commitments, when we have people that we have to take to Fargo. Yeah. And when they're in Fargo and we need to have hearings, it's, it's certainly much more efficient to do those electronically than to send a sheriff's deputy five oh. hours up, five hours back, and then they tag team after a 15-minute hearing and send somebody back five hours and then come back five hours. So yeah. it's... Basically, you're looking at 20 hours of a deputy's time for a 15-minute hearing. Yeah, I I think you know that could be one of the positives of COVID, if if there are any, um, that we're using electronics. Yes. In uh, much more than we were in the past, so I would that's agree a good with that. thing. Yes. So thanks for that explanation, Pat. I think you're welcome. It's nice for people to understand how that works. Thank you very much, Pat. Yeah. Yeah, thank you're you. Thanks, yes, Pat. Yeah. Okay. And we'll go into administrative services. Bob? Well, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, the first item is the County Board Minutes for October 20th. Purvis moves the minutes. Second. Land camera. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the minutes? Jesse, could you call the roll, please? Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Landcammer? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Aye. Next are the bills for the two weeks indicated. People move the bills. Brunder will second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion on the bills? Jesse, could you call a roll, please? Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Landcammer? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Aye. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, um, item number five in your packet is the Human Resources Department agenda. We do have one action item for the board's consideration today, and that is authorization to create a health care savings plan. I believe uh, our human resources director, Laura Alvabach, is uh, on the Zoom meeting and has information that she can share with the board.
Well, just just a moment, Laura, please. I need to do this. One second, I'll let you know. Okay, now there try to go. speak and see if we can hear you. Good morning, and are you able to hear me? Thank you. Yes. yes. Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, good to hear that the technology is working mm -hmm. as we plan. Um, yeah. Before you is a um, a request to add some language to our employee handbook. And this language is related to um, a healthcare savings plan, and we currently have a healthcare savings plan available to our um, the majority of our union employees, and so they have this within their contract. And um, what a healthcare savings plan is, um, it allows employees to set aside funds um, that will at some day be, or will be available to them, typically during re um, retirement, in to to pay for various health care needs. Um, there are some significant tax advantages to having this type of plan available. Who's that? Healthcare. Well, just a moment here. I'm trying to. We need to have everybody please mute. <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that, Laura. Okay. That's okay. Um, and so what we're proposing is um, employees who are non-union and do not currently have this available to them would be allowed or would be required to have any vacation hours that they have accrued over the year that is above the maximum accrual amount. Um, those vacation hours would be placed within the health care savings plan. And so right now we have a maximum of 320 hours per year that an employee may have um, set aside in, in their vacation accrual. And so we are proposing to allow up to 50 hours over that 320 to go into this health care savings plan. Um, it would happen based on their rate of pay at December 31st. And the language is very similar to the contract language for our um, union employees. The other piece of this would be employees who are um, separating employment after having 20 years of service with the county would receive 25% of their sick leave payout um, would go to the health care savings plan. And so, the way it's currently set up, um, employees who separate have that as a cash payout, that 25%. And so this would just um, provide them some funds into that health care savings plan, which again is going to have some um, tax savings for them and the county as that money is, is um, tax free. So that is kind of an overview. Um, I do want to point out that we um, have really started to make it an emphasis that employees do take their vacation time. Um, I think it's very important for employees to have that separation and have some of that work-life blend. Um, obviously this year created some interesting challenges and dynamics with that. And so, um, but that is something that we are really trying to push so that we don't end up with employees um, having all of this excess um, accrued vacation and, and in some cases losing it. Right. Okay. Any questions for Laura? I don't think I have anything, Mr. Chair. Okay, I, I guess I got a couple. Um, if, if an employee has a family plan and they use the, that health care plan, um, does it pertain to their, their spouse and their family's insurance issues also? Yeah, there, there is some beneficiary. Um, yeah, upon an employee's death, the remaining account balance would transfer to a spouse or a dependent or a beneficiary. So um, that account would, it stays with that employee and, and then has the regular beneficiary okay. pieces. Mm -hmm. 
I don't have any questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Should we bring it to the board? Yep. Render would move approval. Three seconds. Mm -hmm. okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Any more discussion? Jesse, could you call the roll, please? Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Landkammer? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Aye. Thank you very much, Thank Laura. You, Laura. Yep. Thanks, Laura. Thank you. And I think the rest of the stuff is informational, Bob. That's correct, Mr. Chair. We had a promotion of a financial assistance case aid to a financial assistance specialist position. Then we did fill a custody officer uh, position in the jail. Then we have received three resignations, one of uh, being an environmental health specialist in our property and environmental services department, a resignation of a project engineer in the uh, public works department, and then um, a nurse in the mental health center within human services. And so we're still working through the review process of whether we'll refill all of those positions or, um, or not. So um, you'll see um, further information on some of those positions in future meetings. All right. Any questions on the informational items? No. And our next is the um, grant funds. Yes, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, I have number six in your packet is the business assistance grant program. Um, to date, the county board <clears throat> has approved 169 <clears throat> excuse me, applications totaling just under $1.5 million uh, as part of <clears throat> the CARES funding that the county received that uh, we've issued to businesses in our community. Today we have an additional 39 applications that have been determined <clears throat> eligible since the last county board meeting. The total of these uh, 39 applications is $358,951.71. The listing of those uh, businesses are included in the packet. Assuming uh, the board uh, approves those 39 applications, that would bring our total to uh, over $1.8 million uh, having been approved. We have a little over $2 million allocated, so you'll see that uh, this would leave about 168000 dollars uh, remaining um, and so um, just as we look down the road a little bit um, we know that we're going to have to cut this program off soon in order to have enough time to process the applications staff are recommending that we consider November 6 this Friday the last day to accept applications which would allow us to process those applications bring any additional ones to the county board on November 17th, and that would still allow us time to get the funds issued by the December 1st cutoff. So at this point, uh, the requested action is a motion authorizing grant awards to the applications that have currently been deemed eligible. Thank you, approval. approval. People second. Or do you say? We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? It's been really interesting to me to see all these businesses because some I have not heard of before, mm -hmm. and it's nice to see um, all the different businesses that we have in this county and and how fortunate we are to be able to help them during this time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <coughs> Jesse, could you call the roll, please? Commissioner Purvis. Aye. Commissioner People. Aye. Commissioner Lankammer. Aye. Commissioner Brunder. Aye. Chair Stuenberg. Aye. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, item number seven in your packet is an application for an exempt gambling permit. Uh, it's a Pheasants Forever chapter um, that will be holding uh, an activity, I believe, in January. And so staff have reviewed the application and are recommending approval here today. Lane camera moves approval. Purpose seconds. And a motion and a second. Any discussion? Jesse, could you call a roll, please? Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Lankhammer? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Aye.
Next uh, uh, is item eight in your packet. This is a revision to the March 10th, 2020 County Board Minutes. Um, finance uh, was reviewing some contracts and uh, was looking for the minutes to match up to that contract approval. And we realized that uh, that uh, particular motion was not captured in the minutes. And so we're recommending uh, approval of the revision of the March 10th. Looks like uh, Commissioner Pifo moved it and Commissioner Brunder seconded it. Can yeah. they do this one or does it have to be somebody else? Well, I imagine they could. Doesn't I don't believe it matters. Okay, I was just curious. Mark, would you like I'll to just move, move it then again. Move the revised or second. All right. Any discussion? Jesse, could you call a roll? Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner Peeple? Aye. Commissioner Lankhammer? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Chair Swinberg? Aye. Item nine in your packet is the uh, donations for the third quarter of this year. You'll see we received some monetary donations uh, for the library as well as some in human services and the largest uh, a donation, donation being from Alliance Pipeline for uh, the Sheriff's Department for some portable radar displays. We also had some in-kind um, uh, donations to the library and so uh, we're bringing this report uh, here to the board as we typically do to uh, accept those donations. Brunder will move approval. People will second. The motion is second. Any discussion? Just a question. The portable radar displays, are those those signs that say you're going yep. 35 and a 30? That's exactly what I believe so. Okay. Yep. <laughs> That's what I thought. I just thought I'd ask. That's all I have. Jesse, could you call a roll? Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner Peeple? Aye. Commissioner Lankhammer? Aye. Commissioner Brunder? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Aye. Are we done for the day? That's all I have. All we have is our uh, commissioner reports, and I think we'll start with Colleen today. Okay. Um, on the 20th, um, we had the NACO Central Region call, and after that, I was invited to an all-staff meeting at NACO. Um, mm. Deborah Cox is retiring, or I don't think retiring is probably the right word. She's pretty young. Um, she's gonna. Um, she's decided she's gonna stay home with her daughter. So. Um, it was, they did a great video um, of Deborah during her time at NACO, and um, then we all got to talk a bit about, all the past presidents got to talk about Deborah and how great she was, so it was great fun. And then after that, um, I had a call with Matt, Matt Mass, Meisman, Massman from MICA. On the 21st and 22nd was the NACO Virtual Federal Policy Summit. Uh, that went for two days, and I also had a Southwest Minnesota Housing Partnership board meeting. On the 23rd, um, Vance and I were got tested um, at the, I Gander call it Mountain. the spit place. Um, Gander Mountain. <laughs> Gander Mountain. Um, mm. And then later that day, a Minnesota Transportation Alliance forum. And then later that day, I did a virtual story time down at the library. Um, mm. You're all by yourself in the children's library yeah. talking to a computer. Um, so yeah, no interaction. I got huh? I got to set up some times to do some for December. So yeah, it, it's it's fun. You, it's just kind of weird because you're you're by yourself. Um, on the 26th through the 30th was the rural assembly assembly that was it's a, a national um, convening on um, issues in um, rural America. It was done well. Uh, Tom Friedman, a bunch of other people were all um, participants and um, presenters during it. They had people from across the United States. Um, that went from the 26th through the 30th. Um, the 27th, um, I had a uh, Women's Health Forum Mayo put on, um, and Marianne Bow was one of the presenters um, who's, you know, looking at, you know, how do we interact with each other? How do we help each other? Um, so um, it was well done. On the 28th, uh, Minnesota Transportation Alliance Legislative Meeting. And on the 29th, I had a Southwest Minnesota Housing Partnership Committee meeting on the projects that um, we're looking at in Mankato. And that's okay. the end of my report, Mr. Right. Chair. Commissioner Brunder. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. My report is relatively short. Uh, it being the end of the month, I didn't have a lot of committee assignments, but I have been very busy dealing with some drainage issues out in the rural area with some uh, farmers getting out in the fields and getting getting the crops out, seeing some damages and tiles and <coughs> washouts. So we've been dealing with those. And obviously roads with the new snow we got early. Uh, the gravel roads are always problematic for the rural area. And, and then just a few other committee assignments that uh, were very brief. Thank you, All Mr. Right. Chair. Commissioner Purvis. Mine is very short also. On the 23rd, I, uh, Ryan Thilgers and I attended a uh, Lake Crystal City Council work session where we talked about the uh, changes that MnDOT is uh, proposing to make in, on Highway 60 in the uh, city limits of uh, Lake Crystal. And uh, I too have had a lot of constituent calls regarding drainage, uh, planning and zoning, um, recycling, um, lot, lots of lots of different issues, but uh, that's my report. All right, Mark. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mine's not too long, but um, you know, on October 22nd, uh, Partners for Affordable Housing Board meeting, which was discussed, including uh, what we're doing in Pedal Pass Poverty, and I can talk about that a little bit. And after another date here quick, October 26th and also for Maple, we did have our Warren Street Corridor study. And that's kind of interesting, not far from here. Um, maybe probably looking at the middle lane for bikes and cars to turn, uh, you know, left. Or, and then, uh, then we'll have a lane for right, north or south, either both ways. Um, anyway, that's probably what will happen. I don't know, that's still working on that. And then uh, October 30th, we did have our, uh, those involved with our Pedal Pass <coughs> Poverty event. Um, well, actually, thanks to Kip who gave me the idea, and it ended up that uh, we talked to Brian at MRCI, and we're going to use that, that new warehouse with the high, uh, warehouses nowadays always have really high ceilings, pre-stressed concrete, built really solid, and uh, 8,000 square feet, so we're going to have a, our, uh, bicycling event there uh, they're kind of looking at like a hybrid if some people want to do virtual yet and then I'm not sure how it's all going to work out but anyway we'll have a combined but we uh, have other meetings coming along but it looks like that and it'll be in February about the time it's been before and uh, that's encouraging and we really thank MRCI it was just kind of worked great um, I just that's my report there and just a, a note uh, my wife is a chief election judge over at St. Joe's, and uh, she's been doing it for 22 years, I guess, being an election judge. And uh, she said, you better say something about it, because you, I, uh, uh, and it was okay with uh, Michael and stuff. They, they were short of election judges last night that, that they couldn't get there right away and, they, and uh, to uh, set up, so they get set up early. So I went over there and did just the physical stuff, chairs and tables and things, and, and the COVID, a lot more of this COVID items they got to do. And uh, uh, I just want to say, I think the judges, yeah, the election judges are uh, uh, maybe not always uh, thanked or appreciated, and uh, they put in a lot of work. And of course, they're there at, I don't know, she left 5.30, whatever, 6 this morning. And, uh, and then the, some of them stayed later the last night to take care of the electronic equipment. And uh, so the, uh, I just want to say a shout out to all the election judges. They do a good job. And our elections department with, with Michael Stolberger, uh, they, they are absolutely the most terrific. And it's, uh, it's great that we have those kind of people in Booth County to keep our elections running smooth and safely and honestly. So absolutely appreciate it. I think it's really nice that Shirley started being an election judge as a teenager. That's a mm -hmm. Oh, good. Well, that's on the record, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and they certainly are unsung heroes, you know. Uh, they've, especially this year, with COVID yes. and all the different issues that have been going on. I mean, they're, every year that we have elections, the election judges are, are out there and and you don't do it for the money. Yeah. You do it because uh, you're concerned about what's going yeah, on they'll, in, they'll be in the state, in the United yeah. States, and, and so and make sure things are doing proper. So really, and thanks Shirley and all the people that are, are for all the jobs they've done. 
Well, they were even just quickly last night. A um, couple of people actually came in asking. I mean, I don't know. There's only a couple of cars out on the lot. I don't know, but they guess they checked the door and they, they're wondering then what they're going to do. Like one was a younger a student that didn't have didn't didn't sure. know how, how she could do it the next day and and so and you know we told her got and you had to have your utility or any bill and so sure. forth. And, uh, I just thought. You know, it's kind of an interest there already you know, to show up. With. But it also shows what great customer service our election oh, judges oh, yeah. provide. Yeah. Oh, yes. that information. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a very short one, too. We had our central region uh, meeting on the 20th for NACO. Um, uh, Ryan already talked about the Rapid End Dam uh, visit that we went through. Uh, on the 22nd, got to go into the bowels of the Rapidan Dam, and and that's always an interesting uh, uh, trip down to the, uh, mm -hmm. you know, knowing that you got water rushing over the top of you. Um, and we had our COVID test, and uh, nice to say that both myself and Colleen tested We're negative. negative. Yep. That's one of those things you don't want to be a positive person when yep. you have your COVID test. Um, airport Commission on the 27th, and they're talking about an expansion of uh, that uh, the training area is going to have, a, putting in a large uh, 20,000 square foot building for, uh, uh, what's a, uh, North Star. Um, Again, I had kind of, I, I, I attended a policing series Zoom meeting on Thursday evening, uh, rather interesting. Uh, actually, I'm very happy I attended. I was able to give uh, a different perspective <coughs> to, to some of the things, and uh, I think it was, it was uh, brought, it had a positive impact. Um, other than that, um, I went and talked to uh, Deb down in HR yesterday morning about uh, my benefit enrollment since I'm uh, I'm turning 65 this month and I have have some changes that are made and I I, I have to say that uh, our HR has is very knowledgeable and we're we're pretty blessed to have the people we have down there, um, you know. So and that's the end of mine. And I think that's the end of the meeting. That's all we have, Mr. Chair. Uh, Move we adjourn. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, Jesse, call a roll. Commissioner Purvis? Aye. Commissioner People? Aye. Commissioner Landcammer? Aye. Commissioner Brumner? Aye. Chair Stuenberg? Aye. There we go. <coughs>